So it's uh, my pleasure now to introduce a terrific set of speakers from several of the companies that have uh, worked with us in preparing the Getting to Zero agenda. Uh, you have their bios uh, on your, uh, in your packets. I won't take the time to run through them, uh, but please welcome me in joining uh, from your far left, uh, Ashley Allen of Mars, Gloria Mara Gomez from Dow, uh, Michael Lamans from Lafarge Wholesome USA, uh, Rick Johnson from Entergy, and Steve Harper from Intel. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us, and, and thanks also uh, to each of you and your companies for your participation, not just today, uh, but in the process that has uh, led to today. Um, I, I want to start with a, a couple of basic questions for each of you. Um, we know that the decarbonization challenge is actually a very diverse set of challenges. It's not a single one. Uh, so from the perspective of your company or your sector, what, what are the most critical challenges that you face in moving toward carbon neutrality? And if you could point to one or two of the policies in getting to zero that you think will be most helpful to you in meeting those challenges. Um, and why don't we start uh, with you, Ashley? All right, land sector gets to go first this time. There you go. I like that. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Ashley Allen with Mars Incorporated. I'm our climate and land senior manager. Um, let me just ask a quick question of the audience. How many of you are related in some way to the land or ag sector? OK, so kudos to those of you who are. You're ahead of the game. And for those of you who aren't, I would strongly encourage you to figure out a way to link your work to this sector. Uh, because we absolutely cannot solve the climate change challenge unless we figure out how to reduce emissions and, in fact, increase uh, removals via the land sector. It has to be part of the solution. And you might be wondering or, or just trying to sort of figure out why would a food company, how, do, how does a food company fit into that uh, framing? So Mars, as you know, especially if you celebrated Halloween a couple weeks ago, is a confectionery uh, food and maybe you didn't know pet care company. So M&M's, Skittles, Snickers, but also Uncle Ben's Rice, Pedigree, Sheba, et cetera. And you can imagine with that kind of a portfolio, um, we have a massive supply network, so a really huge supply chain that reaches into agriculture in multiple countries around the world. So if I think about our biggest challenge um, in, in you know, getting to zero or in contributing to the, the effort <coughs> against climate change, um, it really is the fact that for our carbon footprint, 80% of our emissions come from agriculture or land use change. Only 5% of our emissions come from our direct operations, which is very different than probably a lot of the other companies up on stage, but it is really common for food and agriculture companies. So what that really means is we only have a direct uh, influence on a really small proportion of our, climate, uh, of our carbon footprint. And we have to find ways to indirectly influence a huge chunk of those emissions. And so that's the real challenge. And I think, you know, globally, the land use sector is responsible for about a third of emissions, so critically important. In the U.S., agriculture is, is uh, responsible for around 9% of emissions, and the forest uh, sector uh, is actually, the forest and then sort of natural forests um, actually are an emission sink. So we're in a better place in the U.S., but why shouldn't that be even a, a larger part of, of the solution? Why shouldn't we have an ag and land sector in the US that is really truly maximizing its potential to um, be uh, an emissions removal, um, uh, to be in the, in the process of removing emissions? And I think that the key opportunities there that were highlighted in the report are really helping farmers find the right cost effective uh, and in fact even you know um, profitable ways to be part of that solution. Already so many farmers are working on regenerative agriculture techniques, using cover crops, et cetera, but we have tremendous potential to ramp that up in the US and tremendous potential to improve uh, the health of our soils through carbon sequestration. So really finding ways to incentivize farmers through uh, financial incentives, loan opportunities, uh, tax incentives, whatever it takes to really help them be, uh, maximize their potential as part of the solution, I think is pretty critical. 
Great. Thank you. Gloria Mar. From, hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you to be here. I'm Gloria Mar Gamez from Dow Chemical. Uh, for the industry sector, as the uh, getting to zero very clearly states, one of the biggest challenges, what do we do with our thermal need? Our processes in nature require a lot of thermal load. And, um, and also some of the processes, uh, you know, through furnaces and boilers and why not, and combined heat and power, which we already do, how do you do that? How do you move that? So in one hand, and we're already doing a lot of R&D on advanced manufacturing technologies and making them more efficient, but what's the next step? So definitely uh, carbon capture, some sort of use or storage is key, is critical. Um, it's a proven technology, it's already out there, and it's there for concentrated uh, streams. But for most of our processes, which use natural gas, you know, the stream of CO2 is quite diluted. So we need a lot of support from the federal government and policies on how do, how do we advance on capturing those diluted um, emissions or the, those diluted CO2 streams. And, how, and then, of course, the whole infrastructure, and how to bring it from where it is emitted to where it's needed or where it can be um, used as a sink or storage or um, used in a different way. And so, again, I would say that, of course, having a framework that is uniform for everyone as a level field, um, to have the, the very clear uh, market signals on pricing is needed, and of course, on a long-term view, not every other cycle. <laughs> so I think that would be the, our highest challenge. Great, thanks. Michael? Yeah, so good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Lamans with Lafarge Wholesome, so I'm honored to be here today to be part of this panel. Um, Lafarge Wholesome is the world's largest cement producer in the U.S. We are also the number one cement producer, so every one in five batches of concrete that's produced in the U.S. is, is done with our cement. So cement by itself is one of the issues uh, with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. We are a very large emitter, uh, one to two percent in the U.S., uh, six to eight percent globally, but we're also part of the solution. And I'll go into that a little bit when, when, we're, when we talk about buildings and sort of the uh, sort of all of the solutions that we provide to buildings and transportation. Uh, for the cement sector, uh, we, we have a unique set of challenges that are simil similar to the chemical sector, that we are a very energy intensive uh, business, uh, but we're also significantly trade exposed. Um, so the, the policies that are outlined in the framework talk about how do we have a just transition, how do we address uh, issues around leakage of emissions from the U.S. to elsewhere, uh, those are very important principles that are outlined in the report that are important to the cement sector. Now, we also need assistance in transitioning. So, so the company over the course of the last 10 years has been upgrading our facilities. We've invested uh, billions of dollars into our manufacturing business in the U.S. to improve energy efficiency, to switch from fossil fuels to alternative fuels, which for us are transitional fuels, which could include uh, waste to energy. It also includes uh, switching to natural gas. So there's a lot of transition that will happen that will occur that gets us to uh, deeply decarbonizing the sector. Uh, for us, if we achieve 100% reduction in our CO2 from fuels, it only addresses 40% of our emissions. So the other 60% are the result of the, the, uh, the chemical process to produce cement, and that's where uh, it's carbon sequestration is critical to the sector. So the way that we get to deeply decarbonize or to get to zero by 2050 has to include carbon sequestration. It has to use carbon uh, capture and reuse. And those are areas in the U.S. that we're actively investing in today. Uh, so it's not, it's not something that's sort of a, a dream, as, as Gloria Mar said. It is something that works. Uh, we can utilize and we can use to decarbonize the sector. So a lot, a lot of variant aspects of the report are, are critical to the cement sector and to our efforts to decarbonize the cement sector to get to zero by 2050. Rick. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks so much for coming this morning, and thanks to C2ES for this great work and your, all, all your great work uh, and for inviting all of us to participate this morning. Um, Intergy, if you don't know who we are, we're an electric utility in the Gulf South. Uh, we serve 2.9 million customers in Arkansas, uh, parts of Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, and Mississippi. Um, 
in the report, the power sector is identified as a linchpin uh, for decarbonization efforts across the economy. Uh, primarily uh, because of the substantial decarbonization that our sector has already gone through uh, over the last couple of decades. Uh, in the report, it mentions that it, since 2005, the sector has reduced emissions by 27%. Um, so as other sectors turn to electricity to decarbonize their operations, transportation sector, industrial sector, uh, commercial sector, uh, uh, building sector, all the other sectors that are here on the stage with me and beyond, um, the biggest challenge I see for the power sector is continuing that momentum uh, and in fact uh, accelerating that momentum towards decarbonizing our own operations so that we continue to provide low carbon power that can help other sectors decarbonize their operations. Um, so we've, we've achieved a lot so far, but I see our biggest challenge as uh, maintaining that momentum and in fact accelerating that momentum through the ongoing portfolio transformation that the entire sector has gone through. Uh, our company has, just like others in the sector, have focused on integrating renewables, turning over our existing fossil fleet to more efficient modern generation, uh, preserving our nuclear assets, uh, and, and focused on the efficiency of our, of our processes overall. So uh, continuing that momentum is a challenge uh, just because we're moving very fast, uh, and, uh, but we think that uh, as the report identifies, uh, you know, we need to. Um, this is an important issue that, uh, that is impacting, uh, especially our part of the country, South Louisiana. Uh, is, uh, is, uh, the coast of Louisiana is, is heavily impacted by sea level rise, uh, coastal erosion. Uh, those physical factors are happening, uh, and so uh, we need to take action. Um, and there are some policy levers identified in the report that, uh, that can help us there. Um, you know, utilities and the power sector, we plan long term. We look decades into the future for our assets and our, our investments. So a, uh, Entergy has, as Exelon mentioned earlier, uh, Entergy uh, has long advocated for a stable, predictable price signal on carbon emissions mm -hmm. uh, such that we can <coughs> include that in our investment decisions. We have an internal price on carbon that we use to stress test and evaluate investments uh, in our integrated resource plans and our overall business plan, uh, but having some certainty uh, to help us uh, uh, evaluate those investments uh, would be very helpful, uh, as well as others have mentioned uh, a focus and optimization of our research and development efforts at the national level uh, on clean energy technologies uh, and carbon capture and sequestration uh, is important to our sector as well. Great, thanks. And uh, Steve. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, Steve Harper with Intel Corporation. Um, We've been a big supporter of C2ES for a little bit over 20 years now and a supporter of and participant in this particular study. And we think it provides an excellent, very pragmatic roadmap um, to how we make progress towards net zero. Um, in answer to your question, uh, first a little bit about Intel that people may not know. We are very unusual in the high tech industry in that we make our own stuff. Most of the big name high tech um, uh, labels out there either, they mostly design their own products, they will turn it over to somebody usually in Taiwan or China to manufacture, and then they market it. We make our own stuff, and about 50% of our value add is here in the US. So we've got a factory network around the world uh, in Arizona, New Mexico, Oregon here in the US, in Ireland, in Israel, uh, and China, and Vietnam. Uh, but again, about 50% of our value add is manufactured here in the US. Um, our plants are huge. They look like I used to be in the refinery business, in the old Amoco oil. Our plants look like big refineries. They are huge with a lot of piping. Our biggest facility in Oregon takes about 20 minutes to drive around. That's how big the campus is. And so we have, uh, we have a footprint. Now, uh, in answer to the question, our biggest concern historically for the 20 plus years I've been at the firm has been that people are gonna ban the use of fluorinated gases. You cannot make semiconductors without fluorinated gases and some related gases like N2O. 
Um, we use those gases in very small quantities, and we emit them in extremely small quantities. But people are concerned about fluorinated gases because of their high global warming potential number. Put things in context, I think the latest U.S. greenhouse gas emissions inventory, if you add up the entire U.S. semiconductor industry, we're 0.08% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. So we're in the noise. But again, because of the high global warming potential numbers and because we're a growth industry, people care about that. What have we done? We have, going back almost 20 years, driven uh, a worldwide semiconductor voluntary commitment to reduce emissions. We've reduced emissions somewhere on the order of 60% uh, from where they were 20 years ago, um, 60 to 70%. So it's probably the most successful voluntary commitment ever undertaken by an industry in the greenhouse gas climate change world. And as a result, we have mostly um, avoided direct uh, regulations. But it's the key thing here is this is not like HFCs and other fluorinated gas, which we use in our chillers. HFCs have substitutes, um, fossil fuel-based substitutes, albeit but they have substitutes. The gases we use right now, we have spent 30 years and billions of dollars as an industry to try and substitute. So everything else apart from the innovation agenda, we need to make sure the governments allow the continued use of these critical gases, most importantly because those gases are used to produce products that help every other industry reduce their emissions. And here we talk about the footprint and the handprint. Every industry has a footprint that's your direct negative impact on the climate. Our industry is fairly unique in having a large handprint. A lot of NGOs have done a lot of study to show that our industry is carbon negative on balance because our products are used in smart uh, buildings, smart cars, uh, energy efficiency applications, increasingly with the Internet of Things, cloud computing, it is all climate Plus, it's all helpful to the effort to reduce climate. And to that end, the report includes, now Brad didn't give it enough of a, of a spotlight right at the end, but uh, the report does have a lot of good content about digitalization and the use of IT to reduce, and, and to reduce emissions. And part of the issue here is it's, it is cross-cutting, right? So our technologies and our customers' technologies are used throughout every other industry to improve uh, energy efficiency. The first example of that I ever experienced is in Jim Nolan's here from, from BP, the old Amoco oil. When we wanted to make our refining operations, uh, the focus was making them more profitable, not so much more energy efficient, but that's how we got to energy efficiency. We bought a bunch of HP computers and HP sensors and outfitted our refineries uh, to be much more efficient, so we burned less energy to make a gallon of gasoline or diesel oil or whatever it was. Uh, that is an old 25-year-old example of what's possible. The report has a lot of examples of other things that uh, are happening and can happen to a greater degree with a push from policy because uh, a lot of these technologies and techniques are simply not known, particularly by small and medium-sized enterprises. And the government, through smart procurement and through smart R&D uh, and through simply getting the word out, um, can make a huge impact in improving the energy efficiency of every other sector, including our own, because we try to use our own products and make our own operations more <clears throat> efficient. So those are the policies on the defense right. and the offensive side. Okay. So we're going to come back to that, uh, that point you were just ending on there. First, I just want to let all of you know that we're going to have time a little later to hear your questions, uh, but we're going to uh, continue uh, with a couple more rounds up here first. Um, so, I mean, we, we, we got a good sense of the very distinct challenges uh, faced by different sectors, uh, but uh, as you were alluding to, Steve, and, and you, Rick, as well, um, uh, sectors don't, uh, don't operate in silos. Uh, there's a lot of interdependence between sectors, and, and I think that's a, an issue you really encounter as you dig deep into the decarbonization challenge. Uh, I mean, what happens in one sector can create uh, new opportunities or new challenges for another sector. 
Uh, and because we've had the benefit of participation from so many different sectors, I, th I think part of the value of Climate and Innovation 2050 has been the opportunity for those cross-sectoral discussions. So uh, tell us a little more as, as you look at these issues, what are the <coughs> intersectoral dynamics that you think are most important to your particular company or sector? And uh, I'm going to reverse the order this time and, and, and let Steve uh, pick up where he left off there. Well, one of the big things in our company and our supply chain operations, which is a big client group of mine internally, and it's, it's common in a lot of other industries, is what is called ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance. And it's how large, com we're, we're kind of a funny company in the sense that we're not at the end of the supply chain. You know, we don't sell to you directly. We, it may seem like it because you hear our commercials all the time, but we sell to somebody else who sells to you. But so we're kind of in the supply chain and towards the end of the supply chain. But big companies like Intel spend a lot of time, we certainly do, working with our top tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers to make sure that they are implementing um, the same kinds of environmental, social, and governance initiatives that we are because our customers are requiring that of us and our investors are requiring that of us and perhaps more importantly over time, our employer, uh, employees are demanding that of us to, to attract and retain qualified, dedicated, highly educated people in our industry is difficult. And if, you would, if you're not a leader in the supply chain space, uh, among other uh, elements of being a good sustainable enterprise, you, you have a problem. So the issue for us is it's, it's partly um, investor pressure to make sure that we can show that our supply chain is as green as we are. Um, on In terms of the chemical supply chain, particularly the issue for us is getting more and better research done to find alternatives either outside the fluorinated gas realm or a lot of the ways we've reduced our emissions is by going from higher to lower uh, GWP gases. So there's a constant effort with our gas suppliers uh, and our chemical suppliers to really push the envelope. But right now, fluorine, f fluorine is suspect environmentally because it's very stable. And its stability is what makes it unique and invaluable in our production process. So that's number one. And number two, on the energy efficiency front, we have pushed very hard on the energy efficiency of our products but on our, our processes and our factories as well. And there we're discovering, uh, we, we, our manufacturing occurs in what are called tools, which are 50 to $100 million machines where everything is hermetically sealed um, and the wafers go in one end and the process takes place. And it turns out those machines use a lot of energy. And we're finding that as we have reduced the uh, energy consumption or improved the energy efficiency of the rest of our operations, these tools with the more advanced technologies we're implementing now are really consuming a lot more energy. So we as an industry, and it's not just Intel, the buyers of these tools are working with the makers of these tools to uh, develop research programs to you know, dramatically improve the efficiency of those operations. Great, Rick? Yeah, uh, there are a lot of intersectoral uh, dynamics uh, with the power sector. You can imagine, who, who here uses electricity, right? <laughs> Everyone. So pretty much every sector um, is, is our customer. Um, and, uh, you know, Obviously, that represents for us one, one major sectoral dynamic is the opportunity that that represents for electric utilities to partner with our customers to help them meet their sustainability goals, uh, to uh, help them meet their climate goals. Um, this is a, this is a huge focus right now uh, of our sector. Uh, so that that direct engagement with customers is is a key part of. Uh, capturing that opportunity that we see before us. Um, and so we have to engage also with those sectors on the flip side of how rapidly this transition in their sector might occur, um, what that load looks like, uh, so that we can plan. As I mentioned, utilities, we plan long term, <coughs> decades. 
uh, our assets are long lived. So we need to understand from a planning standpoint uh, what sort of uh, impact that electrification will have on our system. Um, and so that this is a, engaging with our customers, engaging with other sectors is critical. At the same time, uh, other sectors, including some here on the stage, um, uh, and in fact some of our largest customers in the Gulf South, are also working on solutions um, in, in their area, uh, that they're, is they're in their realm of expertise. Um, so they're working on those solutions that we can employ to further decarbonize our processes and operations. Carbon capture and sequestration being the primary, uh, the, the, the primary one uh, example of that. Uh, in fact, and as you heard from Ken with Exelon, uh, the power sector is already working across these sector boundaries uh, and with our customers. Um, and working with this project and working across sector lines as we have while developing, you know, going all the way back to the near-term actions and the scenario analysis that was put out, uh, and then this, this, uh, this uh, agenda report, um, has helped us as a company, Intergy, formulate an idea about a collaborative focused on carbon in the Gulf Coast. We'll be launching this in December. There's some information in the back of the room. But we think a regional collaborative uh, approach makes a lot of sense, uh, especially in the Gulf South, uh, we think we're uniquely positioned to start taking action. So we have a lot of study, we have a lot of scenario analysis, we have a lot of analytics and modeling, but we're in the mode now of working across sector boundaries, across and between sectors, to start taking action. Um, and so uh, we're launching in early December, as I mentioned, the Gulf Coast Carbon Collaborative uh, in New Orleans. Uh, and uh, we're super excited about it because instead of just working kind of one-off with customers on their goals. We're, we're kind of bringing everybody together and saying, hey, let's start talking and confronting those uh, issues that we can work on across sectors. Uh, and so we're, we're excited about it. And uh, again, there's information in the back of the room. Thanks, Rick. So uh, Michael, you mentioned uh, buildings and transportation in particular. Uh, say a little more. Yeah, so, so I'm going to throw a little knowledge at you guys just to put, put a little energy in the room. So the building sector, uh, if you look to 2050, so we, so we have a goal of decarbonizing the U.S., but if you look at the building sector globally, uh, by 2050, two-thirds of every person living on the planet will live in a city. And the population in 2050 is going to be 10 billion people. Uh, what that requires between today and 2050 is uh, the build-out of 2 trillion square feet of new livable space. Uh, and to put that into context, that is building the entire uh, city of New York City every month for the next 30 to 40 years. So that, that gives you an idea on the impact of the building sector. So we know in the, in the U.S. It's the, second, uh, it's the second largest emitter of uh, greenhouse gases, principally around heating and cooling, but also for us in the materials that are used in the construction of the buildings. So if we keep doing things the same as we are today, we're, gonna, we're not going to have a, the positive impact that we need to have in the building sector. So that, that's a focus on things like energy efficiency. It's a, it's a look at thermal loading in the building. It's a look at putting in new technology. It's a look at electrifying the way that we heat and cool. There are, there are a lot of things that go into the building sector where as a company, as a cement and concrete company, we play a significant role in each of those aspects of the life of a building. Uh, so for the building sector, there are a lot of ideas that are outlined in the report that make a ton of sense that need to be adopted today um, so that we get, can decarbonize that portion of the economy by 2050. Um, in the infrastructure space, um, I want to focus on two areas. So one, one is around urban heat islands. So we, we know the impact of urban heat islands and we know what we can do to minimize the impact uh, in the transportation sector around urban heat islands. And it's a very easy step for cities to take. They could do it today by, <clears throat> by making very insignificant changes. We also know that, and, and, and uh, sort of frame this up in a different way, if you were to go to your DOT and tell, and tell them that they can reduce the carbon footprint of your car by 5% by making one change in the way they design roads, would you demand that they do it? 
So it, it can be done. Um, and we're working, you know, as a company and as a sector, we're working across all 50 states to be able to educate the DOTs that decisions that they make and the types of roads that they design and the types of roads that they build can have a positive impact. And both of those efforts take significant change. Uh, and I will tell you that state DOTs are not quick to make decisions. You know, you're, we're, most of the things that we work with them on take a decade to implement. So we need to start today to be able to educate, to talk to them about investing the public dollars in the right way that has a positive impact both for the consumers that are driving on the roads and increasing the fuel efficiency of the vehicles, but as well reducing the carbon footprint of that sector. So there's a big, there's a big area um, that the cement and concrete industry plays in both of those spaces, and there's a lot of excitement on the ideas outlined in the report. If they're put to action, it will have a real positive impact to the future. Great. Thanks, Michael. Gloria Mar. So um, I, I think there's a lot of cross-sector opportunities, obviously with the power sector, as Rick very well emphasized. Um, as we move forward to try to electrify our processes and try to make them, of course, less heat intensive, we will need a more um, net zero or, or carbon free power to provide it. Uh, of course, we Dow already has 750 megawatts of clean energy providing energy to our facilities around the globe from solar to hydro to biomass to wind and why not. But we need to move forward and, and, and to keep pushing and, and we're actually in areas where it was not available before, uh, such as Kentucky, we're working with our utilities to make that happen. Of course, um, and I wish there was someone from the oil and gas sector up here, they are key for this um, move, to, for this change to happen. We're already having, of course, conversations with several of other companies on the oil and gas industry because they are, again, uh, without them, the carbon capture that we've been talking a lot will not happen. <laughs> we need them. And of course, on the other sectors, for instance, on the buildings, well, a lot of the materials that we provide help you know, make more efficient isolation of the buildings than, than for they have less uh, energy requirements to heat and to cool down. And of course, in the transportation without many of our products, uh, we will not have what we have today as you know, lightweight vehicles, so, and then therefore we cannot have electric vehicles and, 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 and why not? So there's a lot of uh, sectoral uh, work that needs to be done. Um, this, we hear all about, it. there's no silver bullet, no one can do the work alone, we need to work together, and the more we can have these conversations even with peers that are competitors sometimes, or suppliers, the better and the faster we're gonna get there. And uh, we uh, champion exactly this work, and we're gonna participate in, in the event that Rick is putting together because we only see that happening as we work together and collaborate. Great. And I, I wish we could do more <laughs> in that sector too. I mean, we, we do have a, a, in our 2025 sustainability goals some valuing nature and we're trying to implement, you know, some um, uh, bioremediation and different solutions in our facilities. But yeah, we, we yeah, there's more opportunity there for sure. <laughs> so, so we're forging partnerships even right here up on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ashley. Yeah, so I've got, uh, Six quick examples of uh, cross-sectoral collaboration that we need. One for everybody and one for <laughs> us all. <laughs> so first of all, uh, every company in every single sector needs to set a science-based target. Mars has a science-based target, an absolute emission reduction target that covers our entire scopes one through three emissions. Every company should have one because that's what levels the playing field on how we account for all these things. And that's what makes clear how our emissions intersect. Second. On the IT tech side, so this one's for you, Steve. Um, we need more uh, solutions around monitoring, reporting, and verification, particularly in the land and food sector. So we really struggle in the food sector for being able to, to trace our ingredients all the way back to farm level. And in particular, we're going to need to know all sorts of bits of information associated with those ingredients as they come to us. So we're going to need to know how they were grown, where they were grown, um, if there was certain things that were done that made them, uh, you know, sort of have a less impact on, on, on the environment. All of those things we're going to need to know. We currently don't have a way to know that. Um, in the electricity sector, though really it's the energy sector, I cheated on this one a little bit. Um, it's, it's really been great to see all of the uh, advances in the US in the renewable electricity sector, but we need to translate that for the thermal energy sector. 
So in manufacturing, particularly for food companies, over half of our energy use at the factory level is actually from thermal energy, so heat energy. And a lot of that right now comes from natural gas. So as we clean up the electricity side, it focus, focuses more of our attention on that thermal side. And it's just not in the same place in terms of having cost-effective uh, solutions there. So we need to figure out how to be able to do that at scale. Uh, on the, I cheated a little on this one too because I couldn't think of anything specific to cement. But let's just say, <laughs> on the, the heavy industry side, maybe there's an opportunity with your focus on uh, carbon capture and storage. Perhaps there's a way to, to make that link uh, to removals because maybe the most cost effective tool for carbon capture and storage, the most co cost effective technology, is a tree. So maybe there's some a way there to, to, to make that investment uh, happen through your sector as well. And then uh, in the chemical sector, I think there's two really specific um, things that I've come across. One, um, in the food sector, we really need uh, a solution for enteric emissions from dairy and, and beef. Um, and so there's some chemical additives and things that you can do with feed to really reduce those emissions significantly. So that's one idea. And the other thing is around packaging. We really need some uh, chemical recycling advances to make uh, all the plastic packaging, the things that are so small and thin and filmy now that they really can't get recycled unless we have a chemical recycling solution. So we're, we we're working on that. In awesome. Alliance good. and Plastic Ways, we're, we're working on that. Good. <laughs> Great, Ashley. I, I didn't know where you were heading, but I, but I think it worked out really well to have you sort of bat clean up on. on <laughs> I had more time question. to think through uh, everything. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, so uh, uh, Rick mentioned one of the earlier products uh, of the Climate Innovation 2050 initiative. That was a scenario analysis we undertook with the participating companies, where we constructed three different scenarios and, and did some modeling of each of those, uh, looking at different pathways to get to an 80 percent reduction uh, in the U.S. by 2050. Uh, and, and I mentioned earlier one of the takeaways from that analysis, which we carried over uh, into the agenda, uh, is the idea that decarbonization really is an all-in effort. We need everybody pitching in. Uh, we need government, we need the private sector, we need investors, we need consumers, voters, uh, whatever, whatever hat they, they're wearing uh, to really get the job done. The, the agenda obviously uh, focuses primarily on the role of government, uh, also speaks to the role of the private sector. Uh, but I'd be interested in, in, in hearing your thoughts on uh, uh, what the other actors, so what we need to see from the other actors, from the investors and from the public, uh, and on, on this one, I'm just going to open it up and, and see who wants to jump in first. I, I can jump in first if you want. Um, on investor side, a lot of heard that they are looking more into, you know, doing investments where, you know, in companies that are responsible, that have sustainable goals, that are disclosing their climate risk and opportunities. And but we hear a lot about it, but I, we're not actually seeing. It. So I, I think we need to actually see it. I would. Uh, encourage everyone um, to disclose on and follow the TCFD recommendations. I think we think they're very important for those who might not know. I know it's like a, the task force on climate financial disclosure. Um, definitely, it's something important to do. Uh, we are committed to that, and we're planning to <coughs> do it um, as well, because that will drive the investor community to, be, to take you know, knowledgeable decisions on, on what they are going to invest. And on the public side, I think we'll hear a lot of rumors, especially more today with all the social media, but very little, the public is not very well informed. Uh, and if I think as you know, carbon capture will move more and more, I hope, and we envision that, I'm sure we're going to face a lot of opposition from public that is not well informed of the benefits of it, of how it works, if it is safe, if it will not have leakage of, of the carbon that is in storage, and why not. And, and I think we need to work together uh, as along with NGOs and, and others that are not in the room and how to inform the public so they can make, of course, decisions and they need to go out, they need to go vote, they need to talk, but again, not, or, or even do demonstrations, but again, inform decisions. Great. Steve. Um, I'll point to NGOs and, uh, well, NGOs in general. Um, <clears throat> on the finance front, I'll just say something about finance uh, first, though. Um, even as recently as 10 years ago, when we would go around and meet with investor groups, um, it was the, the, the socially responsible investment funds and fund advisors who cared about this stuff 
you know, the series of the world um, and the traditional financial houses uh, didn't care. This was not on their radar screen. That has changed completely. Um, and so um, I think that's, that's for the good uh, in, a, in a lot of ways. And it's changed for a lot of self-interested reasons, but you know, self-interest is to a large extent what drives progress. And so how you align self-interest with a common interest is really the goal of public policy. On the NGO front, I'll say two things. One, I think, although things have improved, um, in the chemicals world, there is this naive assumption that um, there's always a safer chemical out there. So whether, you know, whether it's a fluorinated gas that we use in small quantities for um, the photolithography, or it's, it's a liquefied fluorinated uh, chemical that we use in other parts of our um, uh, processes, there, there's often an assumption in the, most of the NGOs that there is a simple substitution out there and the substitute is gonna be better um, from an environmental standpoint. And very little attention to paid to looking at whether there are in fact substitutes and analyzing what the effects of those substitutes are. Um, I quibble with science-based targets. Uh, we're in the pro we, we're dedicated to f to developing a science-based target, and this isn't. I want to be clear. This is not a criticism of CDP or some of the other groups involved in that. But if you look at the companies that have uh, reached science-based targets, um, there are very few of them that are manufacturers. They're mostly companies without much of a footprint to begin with, and um, they're also companies that haven't done a lot of admissions reductions in the past. Um, and they're also, generally speaking, not companies in high growth markets. So we're an industry which is growing fast, which has made 60 to 80% reductions in our footprint over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, and we also have a handprint. You know, most industries can't do anything but reduce their footprint. They can't say this is what we're doing to help others reduce their footprint. None of those factors can be captured under the current methodology uh, that's employed to set science-based targets. So we're working with a couple of other semiconductor companies um, in Taiwan and here in the US to work with CDP and the NGOs involved in science-based targets program to start to evolve a different approach um, you know, 80 by 50 or 100 percent, net zero by 2050, can't be applied in a cookie cutter way to every industry. That isn't science-based anything. Mm. Um, and we're making progress. It's slow but sure. The iron and steel industry is out in front of us, uh, working with ACEEE and CDP, uh, because even in the even in the iron and steel industry, it's complicated. Um, so. Um, I think there is a slow but sure, but we need more open-mindedness and creativity on the part of, of NGOs generally in this whole realm. Um, and I, I'm not, I'm taking C2ES out of the mix here because you're about <laughs> as creative as it gets. So. Yeah. And, and, and uh, of course, you're not quibbling in the least with science. No, 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 it's the, yeah. Rick. Yeah, so uh, just to uh, kind of echo or, or build on the NGO comment, um, I think working with NGOs, um, you know, when, when you do any sort of collaborative, the more inclusive you can be, the better, right? Because you bring more uh, perspectives to the table. Um, so, for example, this uh, collaborative that we're starting in the Gulf Coast is not an energy collaborative. It's, a, it's actually going to be run by the U.S. Business Council for Sustainable Development. Uh, it, and it's including other utilities. Uh, there's some in the room, and, some, uh, and all sectors uh, of the economy are, are, are going to be included in that collaborative. Eventually, NGOs and regulators will be pulled in and other stakeholder types. Uh, but for the launch, we're sticking with business and industry just to kind of get it going. So that sort of engagement with, with NGOs uh, in a collaborative form is very important. Um, and on the, uh, the comment about TCFD that Gloria Mar made, uh, I couldn't agree more um, that uh, that framework uh, provided us, we, we did our climate scenario analysis and report and published it earlier this year, it provided us with that sort of roadmap of how to, how to think about um, this issue 
from a risk and opportunity standpoint and also to think economy wide. Uh, that's, that, that's a clear uh, uh, advantage of going with that, <coughs> excuse me, framework. Um, investors, you know, they're seeking to decarbonize their investment portfolio, right? They're, uh, uh, and as they do that, remaining engaged with the power sector and in fact all of their holdings uh, is, is key uh, so that they can make those informed investment decisions. Uh, an example, you mentioned ESG earlier, uh, Steve, an example of that is uh, how the power sector partnered with uh, investors through EEI to develop the ESG uh, reporting template. Uh, and that has been uh, very successful. <clears throat> Many utilities are using that to disclose ESG metrics and performance information in a kind of a standardized, uh, streamlined uh, format, uh, a solid format that, that has been uh, created through that collaborative approach. Uh, and lastly, in terms of the public, which, uh, you know, we, when we say public, we primarily mean customers, of course. Um, but, you know, come to go, interact with your utility, engage with your utility, your electric company, uh, and ensure they understand your goals. Uh, and, and so that we can help you with those and plan for them. Um, but every single one of us as a citizen of this planet needs to understand our own personal carbon footprint. That's one thing, educating yourself. Uh, understand your carbon footprint. There's uh, uh, numerous calculators out there uh, that, and online tools that can help you do that. Uh, they can help you, um, uh, give you recommendations on how to minimize and reduce your carbon footprint. But until, I mean, the, the mass is taking action in, in terms of the public, the mass is taking action like that uh, is extremely powerful. Now look, I don't have a zero carbon footprint. I don't think anybody in this room does or anybody on this planet does. Uh, but uh, I think the closer we can all uh, move that direction and minimize, uh, I think is going to uh, help the economy overall decarbonize. Who's jumping in next? Yeah, I, I, I will. So uh, I think for, for Lafarge Wholesome, you know, we've had uh, CO2 reduction targets as a company for nearly two decades. Um, Ten years ago, that was a good enough metric that the investors and employees and our shareholders thought, you know, thought was a responsible goal for the company. Today, there's a change, and the, the change is not new. It's been evolving over the last probably four or five, six years, that there's an expectation of leadership and there's an expectation around action. And those, th that's, for me, the fundamental change that we've seen at Lafarge Wholesome. And I, I will tell you, I'm going to give you a couple first. So we're the first construction materials company in the globe to have a chief sustainability officer focused on CO2 who reports to our global CEO. First one. We're also the only company in the US that actively advocates for a price on carbon in our entire sector. Um, so there, there's, there's an expectation around leadership. Um, we're also a founding member of the CEO Climate Dialogue in the US, which was here in DC just a week ago with uh, many people in this room that is advocating to Congress for action on climate, putting a price on carbon, working on a just transition. A lot of the principles that are outlined in the, the C2ES report, and part of that is not only CEOs of companies, but it's CEOs of leading NGOs. So it is a broad-based coalition that is saying t it's time for action with respect to climate. I will also tell you, our, our US CEO, she has been very active publicly, and this is publicly speaking to employees, publicly speaking to our investors uh, globally, but also in the U.S. we were an active participant in New York Climate Week. Uh, we were an active participant in the Bloomberg Sustainability Summit uh, several weeks ago. Um, we're going to be actively participating in the U.S. Climate Leadership Conference uh, uh, next spring in, in Detroit. So it's being active and public facing. And the only way we can do that is if we're actually taking real action around climate. So, you know, we, <clears throat> we uh, I think this, this next week, we commission our first ever, or we, uh, we realized we commissioned it a year ago, but we will start uh, generating power from the first solar project we've had uh, for Lafarge Wholesome in the U.S. in Ohio. Uh, we're breaking ground next month on the, on the largest solar uh, project in, in Maryland, in Hagerstown. Uh, we, we have 10, 10 to 12 other solar projects that are in, in, in the works all the way around, all across our, our footprint in the U.S., and that is really focused on 
decarbonizing the electricity that we use, and we're large consumers of electricity, so the economics work great. So it's a direct, it's a direct uh, line from the solar field straight into our plant, and uh, we're able to, to operate the plant on that. And we're looking at doing battery storage and a whole bunch of other things that wouldn't have been thought of from an actionable perspective years ago. Uh, we're also doing some things that to push the market. So we have, we have a, a product that's, uh, that's called Portland Limestone Cement. Uh, whether you know it or not, we're starting to produce that universally across our footprint and selling that into the market. It has a uh, 5 to 10 percent lower CO2 footprint than the other cement that you would typically buy. It's not market demand. We're just taking those decisions to produce different products and put it into the market. And there's a lot of things like that. As a, as a member of our uh, U.S. executive team, we meet monthly uh, looking plant by plant at small and medium and long-term actions that we're going to take across our manuf manufacturing footprint to continue to reduce our carbon footprint that makes sense for the business today, but also makes sense for the environment and the long-term viability of us to be able to operate in the U.S. in the long term. So that, that's it. It's a quick summary of my thoughts around leadership and, and, and sort of how that has changed and, and the expectations, I think, from everyone on the panel, the expectations have changed for all of us. Um, and, and we're stepping up to the, to the plate to be able to, uh, to address those and to get us on a path to decarbonize by 2050. I'll be super fast. Thanks. Yeah. Because you stole my thunder on calling for a U.S. carbon price, but that's good. I'm glad you, you stole my thunder. So we absolutely need a U.S. carbon price at this point. It's going to help in so many ways, both to level the playing field, incentivize emission reductions, but also, critically, to help uh, generate finance for um, adapting to climate change. Because truthfully, sectors throughout the US are already experiencing those changes. The ag sector and farmers are right on the front lines, and they already are experiencing uh, tremendous shifts in, uh, and challenges with, with how they plant and harvest based on sort of global weirding or strange weather conditions that they mm. haven't prepared for. So I think that that's absolutely critical. Um, I'll also say, uh, maybe a little provocatively, uh, hopefully not for this crowd, but the US needs to stay in the Paris Agreement. Absolutely, 100%. We need to be at the table because otherwise, we're going to be left behind with the global community, and we're not going to be able to influence all the various rules that are being written now to help figure out how this all happens internationally, how our targets uh, coincide with other countries' targets, how we communicate through various carbon markets and the like. And so that's also a critical piece that we need from, from other players, the player being the US administration. So uh, I, for one, welcome your introduction of uh, Paris into the conversation. And we've already uh, segued into my final question. I want to ask each of you to be as quick as possible on your response to this final question so, uh, so we can open the floor. Um, so uh, Rick, uh, uh, recognizing your call uh, for each of us to undertake personal action, uh, to do what we can to, to shrink our carbon <coughs> footprints, I think we all recognize at the end of the day, it's going to require more than personal action. It's going to require policy. It's obviously the, the primary focus of our agenda. Um, to be effective, climate policy is going to have to be durable. And I think in all likelihood for it to be durable, it's going to have to have some bipartisan foundation. Uh, and we saw earlier this morning uh, that there are indeed some encouraging signs of growing bipartisan interest in the issue. So my question is, how do we build on that? How do we translate uh, the growing public support that we see for addressing this issue into genuine political support uh, for putting in place the policies we need? So yeah. quick responses. Yeah, um, I, I think I was also very encouraged by the conversation this morning. I, I, uh, the Problem Solving Caucus sounded very intriguing, uh, along with the Climate Solution caucus. Uh, but I think an ongoing civil, open, and honest dialogue between all stakeholders. Uh, you know, it's going to take lawmakers having that sort of dialogue among and between the public, the business community, investment community. I think that's key, uh, is, uh, is an open and honest dialogue, science-based discussions, fact-based discussions. Um, and it's not a choice between policy and innovation, as we often see it sort of, ca see it sort of couched. Uh, I think you need both. You need policy to create that framework um, for uh, certainty, but also to create an ecosystem for 
uh, innovations in technology. So uh, I, I think it's um, I think it's important to have both. Okay, a plug for facts. <laughs> Um, I like the problem-solving caucus, which kind of implies that the rest of Congress is the problem-creating caucus, <laughs> <clears throat> which we can agree with or, or not. Um, yeah, no, I, I, no silver bullets. I, I think this issue, the crux of the problem is this issue has to be um, uh, the part of partisanized, if that is such a word. Um, I, I think you know there's a lot of research that shows that attitudes about climate change became more politicized and partisan uh, with the release of Al Gore's movie. Um, you know, which is a great movie and one of the best exam best summaries of the problem. But because he was a partisan political figure, that made it easy for folks on the far right to paint the issue as a partisan political issue. And I noticed Jane Fonda is now out on the street getting <clears throat> arrested. I'm not sure that that's going to help with, the, with making this less of a partisan issue. I'm just hoping through some deus ex machina between now and let's just pick a date next November. Um, so, some solution arrives <clears throat> where we can move on from um, things that divide us to think because because the poll numbers are all pretty positive and and I think the poll numbers are moving in the right direction because people realize the world is getting weird and uh, it's affecting you know weather and drought um, <coughs> flooding um, you know it's the locust and the the, the plague. Um, from the Bible uh, is affecting everybody, and um, that the only concern I have is that we make it out to be such a big problem that people say there's nothing we can do to solve it, and they throw up their hands, which is why reports like this are important, because mm -hmm. reports like this show practical pathways to solutions rather than just, no, we're screwed. So, so more C2ES reports. Okay. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll just jump in and say, um, I think we need to make the, you know, in our conversations that we have, um, we need to make the issue local. Um, I think where we saw the most bipartisan support for solutions was primarily uh, first from congressmen from Florida, right? Because they know that their um, populations on the coast were already feeling some, <coughs> some real high pressures. And they sort of saw that those economic consequences, and that that makes the issue real. It makes it not political, but real, you know, economic issue. Um, same thing, I think, in the Midwest. I was home uh, in Illinois just a few weeks ago, and the farmers were just finishing the corn harvest and and just finishing um, mowing down the uh, remaining uh, corn stover, the corn, corn husks, and. Um, that's way later than that would usually happen. And they harvested way later, and they planted way later. And that has major economic impacts. And so as, I think, more policymakers, but also other decision makers recognize what types of impacts this is having locally, they're going to start to, to get more engaged and, and, and be real about solutions. Um, I would say that, uh, yes, uh, to be leaders, DAO is outspoken. We are supportive of the work of C2ES and many others and in different associations. When uh, the current administration announced that they were going to get out of the Paris Agreement, we were part of the movement of companies that, you know, pay an ad and a letter in all the major uh, newspapers saying, please no, please stay, reconsider. And when, so that's, yes, having those federal uh, conversations and advocacy, it's important, but also I would say as a local level. Um, next week, a group of companies, and this is the second time we're going to have meetings with the Office of the Governor of Texas, so what we need to you know, have more carbon capture in the region, and how can we make it happen, and what we need from them. So engaging in those conversations, being a leader, uh, be active, be out there, um, at a regional and at a federal level, and of course in, in the U.S. and also in other countries where we have significant operations, it's it's important. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, I had the privilege last week of being part of the, uh, the uh, part of the group that was attending the launch of the Senate Climate Caucus, and I can't say anything better than the, what I'm going to paraphrase that Senator Romney said. 
where he said essentially that we look like Neanderthals for not taking action. Mm -hmm. And it's prob probably the best quote that I've heard on sort of what inspires me that there's going to be action and there's going to be bipartisan action. Great. Okay. Uh, so uh, now it's time to hear from all of you. I think we've got a couple of roving microphones. Um, and why don't we start right here. If you could um, please identify yourself and your affiliation. And if, if, uh, <coughs> if you want to target your question to any particular speaker, please do. We're probably not going to have time to uh, let each of them answer uh, each of the questions. Thank you. My name is Obi, and I work with the Global CCS Institute. My question is for Ashley Allen. Um, I'm curious, how does Mars square your positive environmental work with the scrutiny that your supply chain has come under, especially with respect to the sourcing of palm oil, um, which is linked to deforestation in places like Indonesia with the ancient paradise forest? Forests play a very important role in CO2 mitigation and climate mitigation. And so I'm just curious as how your internal conversations have gone and how has Mars kind of squared those two issues? Do you want to go one at a time? Yeah, let's. Uh... Yeah, awesome. That's a, a great question. That Those issues around palm oil and actually especially cocoa, which another one that's been in the news quite frequently lately, um, are why our number one carbon reduction strategy is about absolutely preventing deforestation in our palm oil and cocoa supply chains. Now, that's not easy because we actually source a very small amount of palm oil, but most of it, the vast majority of it, comes from Indonesia and Malaysia, which is where the vast majority of it is produced. For cocoa, we source comparatively a massive amount, um, and the majority of that comes from Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. And so these aren't easy areas to sort of dig in on the ground and work with governments to prevent deforestation, but that's absolutely what we're doing. So on palm oil, we are, have been working with the Consumer Goods Forum to try to get a coalition of companies to come together and, and say that not just in our own supply chain, but in our entire supplier's supply chain. So basically, the palm oil companies that supply us, everything they, they grow or they source needs to be preventing deforestation, needs to be coming um, uh, to us in a way that doesn't cause land use change. Um, so we just launched our Palm Positive Plan that lays that out, and we're going to be ramping up monitoring and, and just frankly, being much more strict in our suppliers to make sure that happens. In cocoa, it's a little more complicated because all of the smallholders that produce cocoa, but the same type of approach where we've uh, launched an initiative called the Cocoa Forest Initiative with uh, over a dozen other chocolate companies and cocoa supply companies and the governments of Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana are also part of that MOU to, to sort of lay out what each of our roles is in preventing deforestation in that supply chain. And obviously, with the recent news, it's, it's even more critical that we have to, to do it now. Let's go to this side of the room. Uh, I see a hand way in the back there. Hi, thank you. Um, Doris Marlin, retired DOD. And I'd like to direct my um, comment and question to Steve with Intel. You have helped me connect the dots of the challenges with your industry. And so, um, and, and you, you've said that you have reduced your fluorinated gas use by 60%, great. Um, I think many of us have, are familiar with drawdown and how um, those gases are like the number one potential contributor to greenhouse gas, potential warming. So. Um, I, I understand that those gases, which you've said are some of them are very stable, are 10,000 to 20,000, some of them times the global house warming potential than CO2 and persist not one year, not 100 years, but up to 5,000. And so there was a um, non-implemented EPA regulation 608 that dealt with management of refrigerants, which was not implemented, however, adopted in California, Washington, and I understand pending in Vermont. So I'm wondering how that regulation would affect your industry, if at all. And um, again, I just appreciate so much what you've shared with us about how 
um, even though you, you use gases that you need and do not have easy replacements, um, your, your reference to footprint and handprint. So great question. <clears throat> a couple of answers. First, I want to distinguish between refrigerants and the fluorinated gases and N2O um, that we use in the, f uh, in the etching of the, of the uh, circuits on the chips. So we use refrigerants just like everyone else in industry uses refrigerants and we'll be following you know, the path of Kigali um, uh, and getting rid of HFCs over time. We use a few HFCs in the photolithography process, but that's relatively new and substitutable. Um, so th that's, th that's an area where, because there are substitutes, uh, quicker progress can be made. On the other fluorinated gases in N2O, the way we've made progress, there are several things involving uh, uh, some on-site, um, actually, destruction of the effluent. But primarily, the way we've made progress is going from a fluorinated gas that has a GWP of 20,000 to one that has a GWP of 500. I'm just picking numbers out of the air here. There are a million of these gases. They all have a different GWP. But when we, we've worked very hard to find lower GWP gases that we can use, hopefully, in lower volumes that produce the same quality output <clears throat> that the higher G, and that's been fairly successful. What we have not been able to do is get out of fluorinated gases altogether, which is, again, what we're trying to do with our supply chain is invent our way out. Um, <clears throat> not a lot of progress to report there. But the final thing I will say, at the end of the day, what matters is emissions. You know, whatever the GWP of the gas is, um, Part of the reason why we brought our emissions down is we found ways to use them more efficiently. And so at the end of the day, we're using very small quantities of less G lower GWP gases, which produces a much lower emissions result at the end of the day. Can, can, can I suggest we, you guys take this yeah, one up yeah, after okay. so we can allow some time for some other questions? Thanks. Uh, I've got a hand in the back there. Hi, I'm Ross Salowich. I teach the Economic Science and Governance of Climate Change, University of Maryland. I appreciate the sincere effort of the report, but what I tell my students is that the true villain in moving forward on climate change is the U.S. Congress, and I see the word Congress in this report probably more than any other word other than, you know, the or that. So my question is, there, first a comment, then a question. There's great progress in the U.S. through entities like the U.S. Climate Alliance and America's Pledge at the state and local level. I think that it is fanciful thinking to wait for the U.S. Congress to take action. So what can we do at the state and local level? to move this forward. It will not be a level playing field until all 50 states go in, but if we have the majority of the population centers in, we could do a heck of a lot. And I er encourage C2ES to work with the state and local level when you move forward. Thank you. Thanks, so let me uh, speak to that first. I mean, what we're laying out here is the big ball of wax, right? Uh, and we don't anticipate that this can be uh, enacted in its totality uh, anytime soon necessarily. Uh, there are pieces in here that we can do right now at the federal level. There are also recommendations in the agenda that speak to action at the state and local levels. We don't mean in any way to uh, diminish the incredible efforts that are going on right now at the state and local level. In fact, uh, between that and the kinds of corporate actions we've heard <coughs> described today, that's what's helping to keep the U.S. Uh, on, on a path uh, toward reduction despite the lack of action here in Washington, despite our withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. So I wouldn't read this as suggesting in any way that we should uh, take the foot off the pedal at the state and local level. Again, uh, I want to emphasize that all in uh, uh, message that we've uh, been projecting. Uh, we, need, we need the state action, we need the local action, but at the end of the day, we are going to need Congress to take some action as well. Uh, so we think it's really important to be laying out that agenda so that people have clearly in mind what it is we need Congress to do. Can I add two things? Yeah. 
Uh, number one, uh, for most people who do climate policy at the federal level, the most unknown area of influence or pivot point to make a difference at the state level are PUC proceedings. Uh, the decisions that are made by PUCs, and they're called different things in different states, about the retirement of coal plants and the efforts of dozens, hundreds of local groups funded by the Energy Foundation and others to speed the retirement of uneconomic coal plants mm -hmm. um, has been instrumental, and that work needs to continue. Um, I will say one of the more depressing things at the state level in this year has been the failure in Oregon for Oregon to pass cap and trade. We're the largest employer in Oregon. We work closely with the governor's office to help craft what we thought was a very workable cap and trade program. They had a super majority of Democrats in the legislature and the governor was a Democrat, is a Democrat. And yet because of some shenanigans in the Senate Republican ranks, they weren't able to get it done. If you can't get that done in Oregon, under the current political alignment, it's really hard to see how you're going to be able to do it, um, you know, in a lot of other places that are less, where the stars are less aligned. That that was a big, a big negative outcome. We have Greg here in California That's a start. It's a start. Yeah, and okay. and, on a, and sort of adding on to that, uh, where we see the hope and the hopeful note. Um, so we're part of a coalition called the We Are Still In Coalition mm -hmm. that not only is, uh, has companies as members, but U.S. states, U.S. cities, religious institutions, et cetera. And through both that and some other advocacy uh, efforts by groups like Ceres, um, Mars and some of our peer companies have had conversations at the state level to, in some, in some instances, kind of call for uh, climate-friendly policies, a lot of them related to the energy industry or sort of joining Reggie, cap and trade, et cetera, or uh, in most cases actually where it seems like there's a good opportunity, a good tipping point, really just like putting in that encouragement and joining the conversation and explaining why we care as a company, why we like to see those advances and how it impacts us. And, and so we've seen at Mars some, some good resonance in uh, North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, all places where we have a, a large company presence and where local policymakers then view us as a trusted partner and want to hear how we, uh, ha how we would be impacted by such policies. So I think that's a, a good opportunity for companies to come into the conversation. Great to hear that you guys did that in Oregon. Sorry it didn't work out. <laughs> Next yeah, time. Yeah, I'll give you one, one, uh, one last thing maybe, and, and this is more inspiration. So the state of Hawaii is the first state in the U.S. to mandate the use of green concrete. So when I talk about things that the states can do using procurement, is that they have a big, a big purse and a big uh, set of power to change the way that they're investing and choosing uh, the materials that they use to, to put in place for infrastructure. And there, there, I think that trend is going to continue across the U.S., so that's going to be something. When I talk about how do you get the DOT to buy a product that has a lower carbon footprint for roads, how do you incentivize through basically market competition of companies to invest in, in green, uh, the green products to go into, into infrastructure, you're going to see that. And I think that's uh, when I look for inspiration for your students, it kind of falls into that bucket that there, there is innovation that's happening. And I can replicate that across cities. You know, Denver is a place that's been leading from that front for a decade, if not longer, where they actually mandate the use of the same thing that is uh, the same thing that's being done in, in the state of Hawaii. So just one additional point. I mean, one of the things we plan over the coming year uh, to build on the foundation of this report is actually to use it as a springboard for a set of regional conversations where we will be engaging uh, with state and local officials around pieces of this agenda that they can, they can be implementing. Uh, so we're not in any way uh, unmindful uh, of the importance of action at that level. And we'd, we'd be happy to chat with you after if you'd like to, to get your thoughts on that. Um, I think we've got time for maybe just one or two more. Is, you, you had a question, right? You raised your hand, yeah. Good to see you, Reed. Yeah. Hi, I'm Reed Detchen with the United Nations Foundation. I'd be interested in hearing <coughs> a little bit more about carbon pricing. I think you've all endorsed it. 
I sense that some of you see competitive advantage uh, relative to your peers. Uh, but as you think about an escalating carbon price toward 2050, toward zero carbon, so essentially a carbon price that's going through the roof, how do you think of that in terms of your company, but also in terms of your sector and your market, how that will evolve over the next 30 years? I'll jump in on that one. Um, so as a part of our climate scenario analysis, one of the, one of the cases we looked at was a carbon tax um, uh, sort of stress test uh, on the, the uh, planning that we do out decades into the future. Um, and and uh, we also include a, a carbon tax case in our, our internal price on carbon to make sure that we're stress testing our investments against that scenario. Um, but we also look very carefully at how that flows through uh, and impacts customers. Um, you know, we, li we operate in a part of the country where about 25% of our customers are, are at or below the poverty line. So we have to be very careful about the regressive nature of any sort of price. Um, you know, the, the carbon, uh, a, a steady predictable price signal on carbon has been a part of our principles since the mid 2000s. We put those out and we've modified and updated them over the years. And, and those are principles by which we evaluate any carbon policy, uh, including a carbon price or a cap and trade, whatever policy mechanism is, is uh, being uh, proposed. These principles are how we evaluate it, and we all. And one of the key being economy-wide, a stable, predictable price, uh, but that permanent, built-in, low-income protection is very important to an electric utility, especially in our part of the world. Steve, um, I'm a heretic on the carbon pricing front. Um, I think carbon uh -oh. price. <laughs> <laughs> no, putting a price on carbon is a shibboleth that people, you know, it's a mantra. And when you ask them, what do you mean? It's unclear. Um, I think it's important to set a price on carbon where that will work through the, you know, the, the, whatever market it is and whatever industry it is. But the reality is even um, command and control regulations on a sector by sector basis are a way to price carbon. Anything that increases the cost of using a carbon embedded material or, or marketing carbon embedded material or services is putting a price on carbon. So I'm, I'm less hung up on putting a price on carbon than I am on looking sector by sector and what works. And I just think, and I also think cap and trade, uh, the idea that we're going to do cap and trade and the money's going to flow back directly to the consumer or the money is going to go uh, into investments in resilience, I, I just think is foolish. You know, we've got a multi-trillion dollar deficit. Uh, that's where the money's going to go. Or it's going to get Christmas tree like it did 10 years ago, and everybody's going to get a piece of the pie, and the thing will crater of its own weight. So if we can develop a way to directly price carbon, that's super. But in the meantime, we should not let that be the enemy of the practical which is looking sector by sector, and what are the levers to reduce carbon in each of those sectors. So like we said, not every company agrees with each yeah, and every yeah. recommendation in the report, but uh, uh, pricing plus. Anyone else want to come in on this? Uh, yeah, I can, I can offer some insight. So for, for the cement sector, um, if we have a level playing, so if, if you go back to my original principles, if we have a level playing field in the US, uh, if, there's some, if there's policy, whether it's local, state, or national, that addresses leakage, we can compete with anyone else in the world, and we can do it domestically. Um, when we look at the pathway to 2050, we know there are a lot of steps that require innovation, that's going to require investment, that's going to require the way changes in the way that we manufacture cement, um, that some technology exists today, some of it doesn't. But we think there's a pathway between now and 2050 to decarbonize the sector. And that, and as I said before, it principally is around carbon capture, sequestration, and reuse. And investment in that area is how we're going to decarbonize it. So if we see a pathway that takes us from today to 2050, we can get there and, and have the sector decarbonized. But it needs to include those, those basic elements. So I'm afraid we're out of time. We're actually a little bit over time, I, I, I think you can tell uh, that these are companies that are very deeply and seriously engaged in trying to come up with ways to meet the decarbonization challenge. 
Uh, they're not simply checking the box. It's a pretty complicated picture, uh, both in terms of the challenges they, they face individually and collectively, and, and in terms of the, uh, the potential set of solutions. Uh, the solutions include technology, they include business models, uh, they include different types of partnership, and, and, and of course, uh, you know, what we're emphasizing this morning is that uh, uh, they include policy, uh, but all of that uh, requires leadership. Um, and we really appreciate the leadership that all of you have shown by joining us in developing this agenda uh, and by being here today to talk about it. Uh, look forward to working with all of you going forward to help advance that agenda. Uh, thanks again to all of you and thanks to all of you for joining us this morning. Uh, we will look forward to sharing more uh, as we develop it. Thanks. Likewise. Thanks, guys. I want a, a few final words. All right, you guys. Um, you're, you all deserve a medal for staying uh, as long as you have. I really appreciate it. I, and the questions were great. I mean, questions about state action. Uh, really, what we're talking about here is like we need everybody doing everything. Um, but we can't get to 2050 without federal policy. And it's no... Uh, confusion why we're doing this kind of work now and, and going deeper, as Elliot just said, next year, because something's going to happen at the end of next year. And, you know, our aspirations are, one way or another, there'll be a federal government that is more interested in policy. And what we need is, you know, building the bipartisan muscle, exercising the bipartisan muscle, and also building confidence and support in the business community that there are policies that can help get us where we need to go. And so we really appreciate all of you sitting in. I appreciate you guys. I want to thank the C2ES staff one more time. Uh, Dave Grossman, who I think may still be here, helped uh, on some of the report, Greenlight. Um, thank you. And, uh, and thank you all for coming. I want to thank the congressman again in absentia since they had to go vote. So thank you. Thank the panel. Thank you, Elliot. All right.